I want you to know that it is an honor for me to introduce our president, uh, Dr. Peter Angelos. He's a very impressive and multi-talented individual. Currently, he is the University of Chicago Linda Kohler Anderson Professor of Surgery, and there's the view, as you can see it, from the south side of Chicago, where the University of Chicago is located. There we go. He's also Chief of Endocrine Surgery. Here he is with one of our founders, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Grogan, who is a new member this year, uh, and himself. He's teaching uh, Scott Grant a little bit about ultrasound in the OR, uh, because he serves as uh, director of the Endocrine Surgery Fellowship and showing him how to do a parathyroidectomy. He's also associate director for the McLean Center for Medical, Clinical Medical Ethics and uh, in demand to, to address uh, ethics topics for us. This is his credentials, amazing. Nine years, BA, MD, PhD in philosophy, five years of general surgery, and two fellowships, one in clinical ethics, another in endocrine surgery. 150 peer-reviewed publications, 50 book chapters, 50 visiting professorships, 50 course faculty, 270 invited lectures, he belongs to 20 national and international societies and has had multiple teaching awards. I got tired just reading this. <laughs> but he's also the voice of reason for surgeons. I know you all see him on the American College of Surgeons newspaper that comes and he has a quarterly uh, um, publication. Do you get the feeling that he's right? <laughs> but. You know, he's a very forward-looking individual, and I can exemplify that by the fact that they invited him to play the role of Dr. McCoy uh, Bones in the new Star Trek remakes, but alas, he had to decline. But he is a very futuristic surgeon. He's forward-thinking, and, and hence part of his presidential address is about the future. Let's look at the past. How did he get to this point in time? And I'm going to delve in with a little bit of the magic of Disney into this past. Because I'm going to take you on a magic carpet ride. And it really starts with his father. 1957, he started his general surgery training at the Mayo Clinic, my alma mater. And he was inspired by Dr. Oliver Beers, a very renowned endocrine surgeon. And what, we, what you don't know is Dr. Beers was a professional magician, and he really entertained us when we were residents. Uh, if you got a chance to observe him, he he's, was truly amazing. And uh, this kind of talent rubbed off on Dr. Angelos, and he started his lifelong career as a magician. But he was the original endocrine surgeon in the Angelos family, because here's a publication from 1963, the Surgical Clinics of North America on Carcinoma of the Parathyroid Gland that he wrote with Dr. Beers. But it all begins in Plattsburgh, New York, uh, which is located on Lake Champlain with the Adirondack Mountains to the west, uh, about 20 miles from Canada, very stable population over the years. And here he is with his uh, his parents, uh, Mina and Peter, and older sister, Anna. I want you to check out those baby locks. <laughs> this is the original baby Einstein, really. <laughs> but isn't that a happy looking kid? Um, Peter with his family, his mom and dad, and then along come baby twin brothers, John and Stephen, and um, kind of like the idyllic family. I mean, they stayed in Plattsburgh, New York, where his family had been, and uh, he grew up there. But 
his father rubbed off. Here is the magician in the making at a very young age. (laughs) Ta-da! And he carried that out. He became his own magician and, wisely so, parlayed that into performances. Let me entertain you. What's in my pocket? (laughs) So, imagine you're interviewing this salutatorian high school graduate for a position in college and medical school, and he performs a magic trick right in front of you. You're going to be mesmerized, right? (laughs) Sure enough, he got into the six-year BA MD program at Boston University. He's here with mom and older sister. The things we do in college, though. Try to grow a mustache. (laughs) I think the spirits were working a little magic on him. And quite the ladies' man, right? But his magic moment was meeting Grace, 1983. They were both juniors at Boston University and involved in the orientation program for freshmen. And truly, Grace was amazing. Uh, She has a degree in finance and economics, went on to get a law degree from Harvard Law School, um, supported Peter in his early training, and now is involved with the 30 Million Words program at University of Chicago to aid young children with brain development. Um, Peter saw it and finally popped the question. Steppenwolf had it right. (laughs) There was room for two on that magic carpet. And so the real magic moment occurred in 1987 when they got married uh, 30 years ago. And uh, Grace was amazing because she was very patient. Peter decided, hmm, I need to get a PhD in philosophy in addition to that BAMD, which added another three years to his training, by the way. And... um, How many of you out there in medical school were thinking, I need a philosophy PhD during my med school career? I don't think there's anyone. So we're grateful for it, though. So nine years of training, and he graduates summa cum laude from Boston University with those degrees. Here he is with family uh, at that graduation ceremony. And then it's on to general surgery residency at Northwestern, um, where the chairman was, David Narwald. You heard him speak earlier in in the uh, conference. And uh, he really credits Dr. Narwald with his inspiration, his mentorship, and his support and encouragement to do those two fellowships that really define who he is. So hats off to Dr. Narwald, and we're grateful for his mentorship. But then the The Peter and Grace uh, magic carpet ride starts with the birth of Megan in 1992 during the Ethics Fellowship. And during that fellowship, he did it at the University of Chicago Department of Philosophy dissertation, The Moral Responsibility of the Physician, a Philosophical Examination. Then during his endocrine surgery fellowship, the second child, Christian is born, and then it's back to Chicago where he's staff, faculty for Northwestern University, and during that time, uh, Audrey is born in 1998. And here we are with a recent picture. I need to point out, we've got uh, uh, the marriage here. Uh, Megan. Megan went to Princeton University, then got a master's in arts from the University of Chicago. Her her husband, Zach, has a degree in economics and does software programming for uh, the Chicago Mercantile Association. Megan is going on to get her PhD in art history from the University of Delaware, and Zach says, uh, I, I need a new job in Philadelphia area. So he's got many talents to uh, 
to use there. Uh, we have um, Christian, who's at Denison right now, studying uh, creative writing and uh, likes science fiction. And Audrey here, unfortunately Audrey couldn't be here because uh, she had to go back to Northwestern where she's a freshman in studying chemical engineering. And I want to acknowledge that we have all the family here uh, except for Audrey in the front row. But for us, important is that he did a fellowship in endocrine surgery at the University of Michigan under the tutelage of Dr. Norman Thompson. It doesn't get any better than that. And then finally, the coup de gras. His father gets to come to Northwestern and they scrub in together on surgery cases. He's shown dad what he's learned. So here's his career since then. He spent almost 10 years uh, at uh, Northwestern where he had dual appointments in both uh, surgery and medical ethics, and then on to the University of Chicago, uh, where he also has dual appointments in surgery and medical ethics. It's like going from the north side to the south side. It's like being a Cubbies fan and then trying to be a White Sox fan. It's not easy in Chicago. But to do all this, you, you kind of have to be a magician, right? Well, Bibbidi bobbidi boo he was. And uh, he did not give up those magician skills. In fact, what you don't know, he belongs to two more societies. He's a card-carrying member of the Society of American uh, Magicians and the International Brotherhood of Magicians. But don't you notice that all of those tricks are going at school programs, school parties? They're all kids. Don't you think we deserve a little sleight of hand here? But there's hidden magic at Walt Disney World. This is the place of magic. And Bibby Bobby Boo. There he is. <laughs> You'll do a trick for us? <laughs> so, Dr. Angelos is an accomplished expert endocrine surgeon, he's a prolific academic surgeon. He's the ethicist for surgeons. He's an educator, a mentor, here with multiple fellows. He's in demand to lecture, both nationally and internationally. But most of all, he's a husband, dedicated father, and closet magician. <laughs> he's been hiding this all these years, and we brought it out. So. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce our leader, the man in the limelight, the 2017 AAES president, Dr. Peter Angelos. Thank you very much. Thanks, Seth. That was really great. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Sam, I, I cannot thank you enough for that really uh, kind, kind introduction. Um, it is uh, truly a, a, just an absolute honor for me to be here with you and uh, to be the um, president of the uh, AAES. Um, I have no disclosures for my uh, talk today. Um, I do have a few disclaimers, though. And so it is important to get those out of the way early. Uh, first of all, there are no p-values associated with ethics. And so as a result, everything that I'm going to share with you is my opinion. And as a result, I think you could reasonably assume it's correct. So, <laughs> so um, that makes it easy. Um, the second thing is that often when you hear a talk, especially, you know, a talk at a surgical meeting, you have the feeling that you're going to leave with all kinds of answers. But in fact, when you hear a talk on ethics, it's okay to leave with more questions than you have answers. And so if, in fact, you leave with more questions than answers, then I will consider myself to have done a good job. 
And so part of this is setting appropriate expectations because the secret to my professional success has been low expectations. So I, I really hope you keep that in mind. Um, so that being said, I really I, I want to thank um, the AAES uh, for the uh, for all of you for the honor of being the president this year. I want to thank my uh, fellow officers and the members of the council for everything that you did this year. Thoughtful guidance throughout the year has been wonderful. Um, special thanks to uh, Sam for that really, really nice introduction. And uh, although he did reveal the secret of my interest in magic, um, and I, the other thing that unfortunately is true is that I thought it was really cool to be a magician when I was in high school. I didn't realize that it was really nerdy, but anyway. Who knew? Uh, I enjoyed it and uh, still do, although you'll have to wait till next year for a magic trick. Um, I got to thank my colleagues at the University of Chicago. Um, Ed Kaplan and Ray Grogan have been absolutely fantastic people to work with. I could not have picked greater uh, people to work with and uh, spend time with, and it's just fun to go to work. Um, it's fun to work with our uh, residents and students and our fellows. Um, I need to thank my mentors who you've already uh, heard about. David Narwald, many of you heard speak yesterday, and truly I, I, tr I feel like I owe, owe him a lot. Um, Norm Thompson, you heard about. Um, it was truly a privilege for me to spend time in the operating room with Dr. Thompson, and um, I think I, uh, I learned how to be not only a good endocrine surgeon, but a good person uh, from watching Norm Thompson in the OR and in life. Um, and then lastly, I, I absolutely need to thank my family um, because you guys are the best. And uh, I uh, promised Grace that I wouldn't wax on for uh, a significant amount of time thanking her for all of the wonderful things that she's done in our life together. Um, but thank you. It's been great. So uh, with that said, um, I want to uh, share with you my outline. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is surgical ethics. I want to talk about why the, the surgeon-patient relationship is worth exploring. I want to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at where we have come from uh, and uh, what is the criteria for adequate informed consent. And then, of course, what are the prospects for the future? Because um, uh, a long time ago when I had to give the title for this, I put in uh, the future of surgical practice because that seemed appropriately vague. Um, so um, when we talk about medical ethics, you know, medical ethics has been around for a long time. Uh, when I was um, in medical school, as you heard, I uh, uh, spent time getting a PhD in philosophy and ultimately uh, was interested in surgery and came to think that surgical ethics was an important thing. Um, not that many people felt that way at the time. And, there was a long time when everyone thought surgical ethics was perhaps an oxymoron, um, that uh, surgical ethics is in that category like jumbo shrimp, um, things that don't go together. Um, and I have to admit that when I, um, you know, we, we know about all the stereotypes of internists and, and surgeons, and, you know, many of you don't even know who this is, but uh, this is uh, Marcus Welby, MD, who was a famous TV doctor. And he was sort of the, the epitome of the thoughtful, kindly internist. Um, and obviously very different from a surgeon who's portrayed quite differently. And, and I have to um, tell you that when I had actually you know, done graduate school and worked on my dissertation and then come back to um, do my third year rotations, and then I went to the dean because I decided um, you know, I wanted to go into surgery. So I went to the dean of my medical school to get my dean's letter. And, uh, and he said, so, um, Peter, you know, after spending all this time studying philosophy, what have you decided to go into? And, and I said, surgery. And he burst out laughing and said, what an absolute waste. He said, I can't believe that you're going into a mindless technical discipline like surgery. Now, I have to hope that if anyone came to a dean today, the response would be different, um, that people would think more broadly. But that was a long time ago. Um, if you ask the question, is surgery a purely technical discipline, 
I would answer um, that technical mastery is necessary for surgery. I think there's no question about that. But I would argue that it is not sufficient. And I'm going to try to show you in the next few minutes why I think that that is the case. So we know that there are many differences between surgeons and non-surgeons. Um, and you know, there's stereotypes and there's reality. Uh, we have heard from many people over the years, I don't care if my surgeon is a nice guy. I only care if he or she can cut. That's what people used to say. I don't think people believe that so much anymore. But nevertheless, there is perhaps a grain of truth to that. Um, there are also lots of great jokes. I won't share with you many of them. Um, but you know, the, what's the difference between God and a surgeon? God knows he's not a surgeon. All right, think about that. Um, so, so, you know, there are perhaps real differences between, uh, between surgeons and non-surgeons. Um, but one of the central things that I think is valuable for us to spend a minute on is the way surgeons view responsibility and the way that we believe that what we do to and for our patients is significant, I think is something that we don't pay enough attention to. And um, let me just quote from a really excellent book uh, called Forgive and Remember by Charles Bosk. Bosk was a medical sociologist. He did his graduate school at the University of Chicago. And so if you read this book, and I highly recommend it, it's a sociological study of a surgical residency training program. And... Um, so Bosk followed surgeons and residents around. And um, so there are um, some people who you might even be able to identify. Because although it doesn't say in the book that it's the University of Chicago, it was the University of Chicago. And you might even be able to identify Ed Kaplan in the text. I'm not, I won't give it away, but um, it's possible that you could. Uh, so Bosk wrote, and, and, and Bosk spent a lot of time at Morbidity and Mortality Conference. And I think it's very instructive what he wrote, and I'll just read this to you. When the patient of an internist dies, the natural question his colleagues ask is, what happened? When the patient of a surgeon dies, his colleagues ask, what did you do? By the nature of his craft and his beliefs about it, the surgeon is more accountable than other physicians, and he also has much more to account for. And I actually think that this is very central to our identities as surgeons. And I think that we don't give it enough um, consideration on a regular basis, and I, and I think we should. Um, now, I said it's valuable to look at the uh, surgeon-patient relationship, and you might ask why, but I think it's important because in surgery, in contrast to other areas in medicine, it is absolutely necessary to harm a patient in order to heal them. So that's a little different. Um, the things that we do on a regular basis would be illegal in any other circumstance. So on a regular basis, we all cut people's throats several times a day. That's our job. Now, if you do that in any other context than in the operating room, having ob obtained informed consent, you go to jail. So it's different. And I think that we often lose track of that. Um, Surgery is an intensely intimate physical relationship. We know things about patients that they don't know themselves, that they will never experience, you know, what, is it, what does my thyroid look like? I mean, patients often ask us to take pictures because they're intrigued by that. So we have really special knowledge. Um, we have a very short time frame after we meet a patient at which we need to obtain, we need to explain things to them, we need to uh, uh, obtain informed consent, but most significantly, we have to figure out a way to get a patient to trust us, to do things that are potentially harmful to them. Uh, so I would suggest to you that on the basis of this, I think consent has often been characterized incorrectly. So I don't think that consent should be thought of so much as a checklist, but as a manifestation of trust, and the manifestation that our patients trust us. Um, so let me move on to uh, look at this question of where we have come from, because I do think it's helpful um, to think about the historical view of the relationship between a doctor and a patient. And you know, if you start by looking at um, a famous uh, uh, 
portrait of the doctor from 1891. Um, and, and what you see, let me try a different pointer. Um, so what you see here is, here's the patient in bed, here's the, the doctor, and it's hard to see, but in the back here, the uh, parents are sitting, um, and this is, you know, the uh, sort of common view of what the doctor looked like at that time. And, and I hope that you'll notice, and, you know, I'm no art historian like Megan, my daughter, is, but I interpret from this portrait that the doctor is thoughtful, is caring, is concerned, trustworthy, and welcomed into the home. So these are all characteristics that I would project on the doctor in this portrait. Now, in contrast, let's look at the surgeon from a similar era, similar era portrait. So this is the surgeon, right? It's a little different. So what, do, what can we say about the surgeon? Well, he's brutal. He's callous to the suffering of the patient. Um, he struggles against the patient. And he operates in scary places, the operating theater. So it's not like the comfortable living room of your home. Um, and in fact, prior to the development of anesthesia, surgery was really all about speed. And the, you know, doing amputations was what lots of surgeons did, and battlefield amputations were an important thing. Um, in fact, speed was absolutely essential. Um, it did occasionally lead to unfortunate outcomes. And uh, I want to share with you Dr. Robert Liston, um, who was really a renowned surgeon, known for his speed and bravado, um, and this is a, a portrait of Dr. Liston. Um, his most famous case was, in fact, a really fascinating one to look back upon. Um, he did a leg amputation in less than two and a half minutes. Just think about that. That's pretty good. You can't even prep a patient in that amount of time. Um, unfortunately, the assistant holding down the patient lost two fingers. Um, the patient died of gangrene, and the, subsequ the assistant subsequently died of gangrene as well. Um, and unfortunately, Liston also slashed through the coat of a spectator that was so terrified that he dropped dead of fright. So one operation, 300% mortality. Okay, so we've come a long way. All right, so... so over the years, you know, once we had anesthesia, things changed. And, you know, you see here um, in the Agnew Clinic famous portrait, you know, the professor can relax and lecture and take as long as necessary. The patient's asleep. The operation can take as long as necessary. And if you ask our anesthesia colleagues, they take longer than necessary. Um, so clearly things changed. Um, finesse and meticulous technique became important, were emphasized in training programs. Um, and the, many people assumed that the surgeon-patient relationship was, in fact, going to become less important because patients are asleep. So why do we even have to communicate with patients? Well, there's no question that the patient experience of an operation under general anesthesia is different. Um, than when they used to be awake. No question about that. Um, but I would argue that general anesthesia, in fact, creates the ultimate vulnerability. And so, so in a circumstance where a patient can't defend themselves at all, they can't argue on their own behalf, the trust that they have to place in us is even greater. And it's something that we need to be cognizant of. So when you look at informed consent, I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, informed consent is certainly something we do all the time. Multiple times a day, we obtain informed consent in order to operate on a patient. And we know that we generally talk about risks, benefits, and alternatives. Those are the three things we got to address. Um, now, if you ask how should the quality of informed consent be determined, it's interesting um, because uh, traditionally, we've assessed this by looking at the patient's knowledge of the risks, benefits, and alternatives. How well do they remember the things that we told them? 
Um, but un in, unfortunately, multiple studies show that patients do not remember what surgeons tell them. In fact, often minutes after obtaining informed consent from a patient, if you ask the patient, what are the risk benefits and alternatives, most of them can't remember them. Or if they can remember them, they can't remember most of them. So nevertheless, there's a high degree of satisfaction in the informed consent process by most surgical patients. So it does raise the question, how can there be this discrepancy? Patients remember little, and yet they remain highly satisfied. How can this be? Well, I think that information transfer may not, in fact, be the true measure of success of informed consent. And I would say that patient trust transcends problems with memory. And that I would suggest that informed consent is really all about trust. And trust is, in fact, the basis of informed consent. And informed consent isn't that I have necessarily conveyed information, but that I've created a situation in which my patient trusts me to do the right thing for them. And in fact, data shows that surgeons trusted by their patients are less likely to be sued despite complications. Sort of an interesting thing. Now, informed consent then I would say it means much more than a checklist of risk benefits and alternatives. Uh, good data is clearly essential for informed consent. We have to be able to tell patients what the risks are. We have to know what that data is. But it's truly not enough. And I think that patients, uh, in order to be willing to allow their, patient, their surgeons to put them at significant risk, they have to trust their, their surgeons. And again, I think that's an important thing for us to focus upon. Now, there are clearly added challenges to the contemporary surgeon-patient relationship. Um, there's increasingly an emphasis on volumes and RVUs that pushes surgeons to spend less time with patients. If you speak to the administrators at my hospital, I think they would be happier if I only operated. Right? If I only operated, think of all the RVUs I would generate as opposed to talking to patients in the office. That doesn't generate much RVUs. Uh, now, there's, of course, the electronic medical record. That creates some issues. Um, and in fact, the idea that a patient comes in to see a doctor and that the doctor is talking to the patient and filling out the electronic medical record such that at the time the patient leaves the consult room, the electronic medical record is done. At least in my practice, that's a myth. Because if you ever saw me type, you would never let me operate on you. Right? It would not be, you know, it is not conducive to a, a large volume surgery practice. The other thing, though, is that when patients come in to see us, they are, in fact, deciding whether to trust us. And so the idea of focusing on them and listening to them and making eye contact with them is more important than typing on the computer, I think. So, in fact, I don't type on the computer. Um, so, we know that patient, surgeons are paid to operate, not really to talk to patients, but I think everyone who's been in surgical practice knows that you can't garner trust without communication skills. And so, in fact, when, when, when medical students say to me, yeah, I really love surgery, but I love talking to patients. And so I don't think I want to go into surgery. That always strikes me as a little funny, because I like talking to patients too. And in fact, if we're not good at talking to patients, if we're not good at communicating with patients, the secret truth is they don't want us to operate on them, because they don't trust us. And so again, I think we have to reshape how we present ourselves to the world and to our patients. So I think the surgeon-patient relationship is obviously affected by things like the internet, um, technical ability. As I said, I think it's necessary, but clearly not sufficient, because patients increasingly have choices. Uh, there are rating sites. You can see how many stars you got on the rating sites. Um, there's opportunities com to compare your scars on social media. 
Who would have guessed it? If you Google thyroidectomy scars, you'll find thousands of people who have posted their thyroidectomy scar. It's a little strange, but nevertheless, um, you can find it if you look. So I, I do think that we have to be cognizant of how these other things affect the way patients see us and how they trust us. Now, what does the future hold? Well, this, I have come to decide, is the greatest thing to ever put in any talk. And that is the question, what about the future? Because the great thing about talking about the future is it sounds sort of erudite. You know, people are like, oh, he's going to predict the future. Um, but in fact, uh, Niels Bohr said it well, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. And so, so you know, I'm going to say things that I think may happen. But the beauty of it is that none of you are going to remember it. And so, so none of you are ever going to say, oh, you were wrong. You said this was going to happen, and you're absolutely wrong. And so, so that's why I've come to decide that predicting the future is always good near the end of a talk. And it is near the end, so there's hope. Uh, so I think that the challenge for the future, as I see it, is to become what I would call the complete surgeon. And in that sense, as I've said, technical expertise is necessary but not sufficient. The complete surgeon is technically excellent as a surgeon, but also a great doctor, someone who can communicate with patients well. Surgeons, I think, have to withstand the temptation to become purely technicians. And if we do that, we cease to be true physicians. And we should never let that happen. We should never let anyone push us to purely be technicians. If anyone says, we'll work up all the patients, we'll see all the pre-ops, we'll see all the post-ops, you can just operate all day, every day. We should withstand the temptation to say, that seems like a good idea. So the challenge then is to ensure as I see it, that informed consent for surgery continues to be a meaningful exchange. I think that the surgeons, surgeons today face the challenge of overcoming impediments to the surgeon-patient relationship and engendering the patient's trust. I think that success in surgery demands that surgeons become adept at engendering trust. This is something that perhaps we don't talk about enough in our training programs, but this is absolutely critical to success in surgery. There are added challenges, I think, for today's surgeons. Um, I think that the central question in surgery has changed. So the central question used to be, what can we do for this patient? And that was the question asked for centuries. What can we do? What could be done for this patient? Today, the question is, what should we do for this patient? And that's a very different question. So the question of what we should do for a patient is really a question of surgical ethics, because that has to take into account not only what is the surgical problem, but the patient and their entire life and how it's going to impact their goals and that sort of thing. So I would suggest that in an era of evidence-based medicine and increasing guidelines where there's a tendency to think, well, you know, I have a patient problem, I check the guidelines and it tells me what to do. Um, surgeons actually have to and do practice the ultimate of personalized medicine. So personalized medicine is the new buzzword, right? Everybody's into personalized medicine. But we've been doing that for years because what should we do cannot be answered in general. It really can only be answered relative to a patient's values, a specific patient's values. Um, and so I would suggest that in the privacy of the consult room or the exam room, when we are interacting with our patients, there's no one there looking over our shoulder to decide if we've discussed things appropriately, if we've explained the risk benefits and alternatives, if the patient really understands, ultimately, that's what we have to offer. Whether we decide to offer a new procedure to a patient or to continue with the traditional procedure, that's all on us. That is our responsibility. 
and to ensure that our patients trust us and that the trust is that we're worthy of that trust. So, as surgeons, we constantly address the ethical issues in the care of patients. And I, I, I think this is actually something that we do and have been doing for decades, but we haven't really been calling it ethics. We've just been calling it part of surgical practice. In some ways, it's like Moliere's play. So in Moliere's play, his famous character uh, actually was surprised and delighted to learn that he had been speaking prose his entire life without knowing it. He wanted someone to teach him prose. I think that there's some similarities with ethics and the practice of surgery. I think that we've, in fact, been practicing surgical ethics for decades in the care of our individual patients, but we haven't really been calling it that. And I think it's time that we perhaps bring that more to the forefront. Surgeons, I think, have in the past and will continue in the future to need to consider the ethical dimension of their patients. By deliberately focusing on the ethical dimension of surgical care, I think that we will be better physicians and we will show others that we are much more than technicians. And I think surgeons have to be experts in the ethical care of their patients. I think this is part of our job. I'm going to leave you with just a few thoughts. Um, I think that surgery is not a mindless technical discipline. In fact, it's, for me, the greatest career I could have. And I've been uh, really privileged to be able to do it for so many years. I think that surgeons have to continue to be cognizant of the ethical dimensions of their practice. And I think that the surgeon-patient relationship is really the key to the ethical care of the surgical patient. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and it's been an absolute honor to be the president of the AAES this year. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Peter, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I think it really gets all of us thinking about what it means to be a surgeon and to take total care of our patients, and I think you've been a wonderful example, not only in your leadership of the AES over the past year, but in your entire career. Um, it has been a true pr privilege for me as secretary and for all the officers and counselors to work under your leadership over the past year, and we're really privileged that you took on this position. We do want to give you something to commemorate your time as president, so we have a plaque for your office to commemorate your time period here as the AES president. Thank you very much. Thanks, I appreciate it. And then we also wanted to give you a small gift to help commemorate. And so when we were looking at options, it became very clear this idea of you being a magician, which was a little known fact. Um, and so we know how passionate you are of magic shows, and not just of like the big David Copperfield, you know, but, but, but the small, kind of very intimate setting. And so we found through CORE that there is actually the Magic Parlor in Chicago, just down the road, that has a wonderful intimate magic show. So we got tickets for you and Grace to go see the Magic Parlor on behalf of the council. We also got, um, we heard that you are a collector of fountain pens. And so as someone who collects fountain pens, it seems only appropriate that you would have an engraved fountain pen to commemorate your year as AES president. So that's our gift to you. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Becky. I really appreciate it. Thank you.